Hi, it's Dwyer, DwyerCrime.blog, right? Today is Wednesday, January the 9th, 2019. Let me offer a disclaimer. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, many of you, to my surprise, have contacted me about the Stephen Avery case. The new season of Making a Murderer uh, hit Netflix a few months ago, excuse me, a few months ago. Avery's new lawyer, Kathleen Zellner, has been featured in the new season, giving theories on why she believes Stephen Avery is innocent. Right now, as you know here online, I've stated my belief over several videos that Stephen Avery is guilty. And to my surprise, right, and I am surprised by this, of all the cases that I've talked about here online, and keep in mind, everyone's entitled to their opinion. I'm giving you mine. I understand many of you disagree with me on some cases and have left comments to that effect in the comment section of these videos, right? Of all the cases we've discussed here online, the OJ case, the Amanda Knox case, the uh, serial Adnan Saeed case, right? Of all of the cases we've discussed here online, for some reason, Stephen Avery, of all the accused, seems to have the biggest group of people who believe that he did not do the crime. Well, I've come across an excellent podcast done by Nancy Grace, right? It's called Crime Stories with Nancy Grace. It is a must listen. I have placed the link to this podcast in the comments section of this YouTube video, right? Again, it's Nancy Grace discussing the case Right? She's even talked to Stephen Avery directly. And of course, not surprisingly from my point of view, he lies to her. Right? I've placed the podcast link in the comment section to this video. Let's just go over a few facts. First, Stephen Avery gave an interview with Nancy Grace. Stephen Avery in the interview, and by the way, it's a taped interview. It's part of the Nancy Grace podcast. Stephen Avery flatly says that he saw Teresa Hallbach, the murder victim. Let's remember, the victim here isn't Stephen Avery. It's actually Teresa Hallbach. Avery admits that he saw Hallbach the day she goes missing. He adds that he saw her from 2 to 2.30 in the afternoon. Let's remember that, 2 to 2.30. Just understand that after 2.30, on the day Teresa Hallback goes missing, Stephen Avery calls her cell phone and leaves a message where he says, where are you? When are you coming? Right? In other words, what he told Nancy Grace is inconsistent with his own actions. It's inconsistent with his own voicemail. The Stephen Avery timeline is fictional. What he told Nancy Grace was a lie. Well, let's go further. Here on YouTube, I've referred to the court testimony, the transcript from the trial that has a third party disinterested witness who talks about how the afternoon of the murder He's standing next to a burn barrel. 
talking with Stephen Avery. And he was a bit overwhelmed by the smoke and the smell of plastic. Well, later we find out that Teresa Hallback's cell phone was burned in that burn barrel. Right? Understand, you have a witness here who is literally with Stephen Avery while plastic is being burned in the burn barrel the day Teresa Hallback goes missing. Well, Nancy Grace mentions on her podcast a different fact. That members of Stephen Avery's family, now keep in mind, we're not talking about law enforcement. We're not talking about, you know, members of the legal community who Stephen Avery supporters want all of us to believe framed him. No, we're talking about members of Stephen Avery's family. The night of the murders. See Stephen Avery tending to the fire in his burn pit. Right? This is different than the burn barrel. Where Teresa Hallback's cell phone is burned. This is the burn pit, right? Members of Avery's own family see Stephen Avery the night Teresa Hallback goes missing, tending to the burn pit, right? Swirling around things in the burn pit, where, of course, we later find that Teresa Hallback's teeth are in the burn pit along with studs from the Daisy Fuentes jeans she was wearing are found. Well, probably the most important part of the Nancy Grace podcast, and again, I give it my strongest recommendation, are the excerpts from the confession of Brandon Dassey. Now we know supporters want you to believe that the cops took an innocent uh, guy with a low IQ into a room and that the cops fed him words, told him what to say, and he then gives a false impression, excuse me, confession where he decides to implicate himself in a murder done by Stephen Avery. Well, let me just tell you that the portion of the Dassey confession that's in the Nancy Grace podcast should put that theory to bed, right? Because Dassey is so detailed in what he says about how Teresa Hallback's neck gets cut, about how she gets strangled. He's so detailed that there is no way the police fed him the lines. In fact, quite the opposite. Dassey's going on and the Interviewers then try to stop him. When he says something that sounds a little bit odd, they try to get him to backtrack. Right? Far from trying to frame him. It seems to me they're actually trying to exonerate him. They're trying to get him to explain comments that could be viewed as incriminating. So you'll actually hear on the Nancy Grace podcast the recording of Dassey's confession where the cop slows him down and says, well, tell me 
How did the sequence of events happen? Right? The cop tries to get him to back up to before Hallback is strangled to tell the police officer exactly what happened. Right, folks? There are shows on television right now where you see false confessions and you see cops putting words in the person's mouth, right? Understand this case is different. Dassey's the one who knows the facts, right? The cops know some of the facts. She's shot in the head, right? But Dassey is the one who is talking about the sequence of events. The cops don't give him that sequence. He gives the cops the sequence. Also understand that the confession is just one part of the investigation. The confession is meaningless unless the forensic evidence matches the confession. And folks, here it does. Right? Teresa Hallback's brain tissue is found on the bullet fragment. So, as Nancy Grace points out, unless you believe that the police killed this poor woman and then decided to frame Stephen Avery, and then were able to convince members of Avery's family to give false testimony about Avery tending to the burn pit fire, where parts of Teresa Hallback's body are found, right? And then figured out that Stephen Avery happened to be burning plastic the very afternoon Hallback goes missing and we're able to then plant Hallback's burnt cell phone into his burn barrel. Unless you believe some convoluted version of events like that, this is a guy who is clearly guilty. Right? You've heard me here in the past and talking about some cases question the legitimacy of someone's conviction. Right? Some of the people here online have been convicted of murder. And I'll openly question the Malone conviction, the Dana Chandler conviction. Right here, though, with Avery, I have no doubt. Now, I believe the reason why so many viewers here online believe that Avery might be innocent is because of information overload, right? Understand, as I see it, just the fact that a third party witness is with Avery as he's burning plastic in his burn barrel and the plastic turns out to be Teresa Hallback's cell phone. Just the fact that Stephen Avery is tending to the fire in the burn pit where Teresa Hallback's body is found. Just the fact that Avery himself is giving false statements to people like Nancy Grace. Just those facts are sufficient in my eyes to convict him. I don't even believe you need the Brandon Dassey confession. I don't even believe that you need the car with Avery's bloodstains in the car, with Avery's DNA under the hood of the car. The problem is there's so much evidence here, so much, that people start focusing on arcane facts like whether the DNA under the hood 
of Hallback's car is sweat DNA. Right? People start focusing on the fact that Avery, who of course, like OJ, has a cut. Think about it. Has a cut. The night of Hallback's murder. Right? People are focused on how the blood smear gets by the car key hole on Hallback's car. On the Netflix show, his attorney is there trying to make an argument that, hey, this smear wouldn't have been left this way, given where Stephen Avery's cut hand was, right? We lose sight of the fact that, wow, the guy got a cut the day she goes missing. We lose sight of the fact that we don't even need the evidence in the car to find that this guy is guilty, right? People are seeing him where the murder victim's belongings and teeth are. Right? He's, he's lying to people about what happened that day. Understand, too, the placement of blood smears in an automobile. As you can imagine, Teresa Hallback's car, by the way, this is the same car that Avery claims he saw leave his property. <laughs> right? And we know that's not true. Right? The uh, timeline he tells Nancy Grace isn't remotely true. Right? Um, Avery claims he sees the car leave at 2.30. We know that's a lie because Avery's own call is after that. Right? And of course we know Avery's hiding his identity in the call. Right? Star 69ing on the phone. Well, understand... I know in theory, a very skilled attorney, and that's who Miss Zellner is, right? She's exonerated multiple criminal defendants, has proven them innocent, right? Excellent attorney. But understand, when an attorney, after a crime has taken place, tries to point out that if things took place in a laboratory setting where someone was able to be operating at peak efficiency, a blood stain wouldn't be over by the car keyhole, you know, the ignition. You can imagine that after a murder has taken place where you're in a vehicle with the body and you don't want to be seen, you're going to do things that are unexplainable, right? There's going to be inexplicable things happening. After the fact, an attorney can say, well, how could his hand have gotten over here, right? But you know, just like you know that in a fire, you're going to be frantic and touching things. Right? You can imagine after a murder that you're trying to cover up. After a murder where you're putting branches and stuff like that on the car to hide the car. You can imagine you're going to be touching a bunch of things that your blood stains aren't going to follow a predictable pattern. So to me, watching the second season of Making a Murderer is unconvincing. It's bad enough that they talk to Stephen Avery and take a brainwave and then try to tell us that, you know, Stephen Avery isn't lying, right? When you and I know psychopaths think differently than the rest of us. Right? You and I know that there's shows all over ID Network where some guy who's later proven to have done the killing 
pass the police polygraph. Right, spoke with the police, convinced them that he was innocent. Until, of course, the incriminating DNA showed he was not. Here you have blood, you have DNA, you have family members seeing him tend to the fire, you have friends seeing him by the burn barrel, you have the guy himself lying, you have the victim telling third parties before she goes there how this guy answered the door only wearing a towel before and how he creeped her out. And then, of course, you have Brandon Dassey giving you the actual sequence of events as to who cut her throat, when she gets strangled, etc. And, of course, you have the forensics, her brain matter on a bullet, for example, right? You add it all up, and this guy, to me, is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I encourage everyone here to click on the link in the comment section to this video and to listen to Nancy Grace, who Stephen Avery lied to directly as part of his cover-up. Listen to Nancy Grace discuss the evidence in the case. Listen to Brandon Dassey's confession and ask yourself whether the police who after hearing Dassey say incriminating statements, rather than just lock those statements in and keep moving, thinking, great, we have this kid railroaded, instead the police take a different path. Dassey says something incredibly incriminating. And the police, in essence, say, whoa, whoa, back up. Back up. Tell us that again and be a little bit more clear on when certain things happen. Right, folks? Dassey, whatever you think of his IQ, right, Dassey's actually given an opportunity in the confession to explain himself. And let's just say when he repeats the facts, they're as disturbing as the first time he says them. I hope you click on the link in the comment section to go to Crime Stories with Nancy Grace. We'll make a follow-up video after I hear the comments from the many of you, the many of you who still believe Stephen Avery is innocent. Trust me, after doing videos, I'll get some interesting emails from people, right? I have gotten emails from family members of some of the people whose cases I've talked about. I have gotten emails from people who say that they personally knew the accused, right? In the Stephen Avery case, it's fascinating. I've gotten a bunch of emails from just people like you and me who are interested in figuring out whether or not someone accused of a crime is actually innocent or guilty. And you have people who want to argue the case, right? Just understand, if you're going to prove this guy is innocent, then you have to disprove all of the incriminating evidence. Right? You really can't be selective. You can't tell me, hey, there's no such thing as sweat DNA. Right? Because my response to you is going to be, do we even need the evidence in the car? Right? Family members see him tending to the fire the night of the murder. <laughs> right? I mean, do we even need the evidence in the car? If you're going to tell me, hey, Brandon Dassey has a low IQ, my answer to you is, do we even need Brandon Dassey's confession? Right? Understand, the evidence is that overwhelming. If you consider the car and the confession, as well as everything else, family members seeing him tending to the fire, then I don't know how anyone can claim that this guy is anything other than guilty. 
Also, don't confuse good theories with evidence. I understand that the city was negotiating with him over false imprisonment. I understand there's a theory out there that cops might want to frame him to avoid the prior liability, right? You know what? That sounds great until Stephen Avery himself starts lying on tape to people like Nancy Grace, saying things that are demonstratively untrue. Right? Understand, there is simply no evidence that the police are behind Teresa Hallback's statement before she goes to see Stephen Avery that Avery answered the door with just a towel on and that he creeped her out and that she didn't want to go back to his place. Understand there's no evidence that the police are behind Stephen Avery feeling a need to star 69 his calls to Teresa Hall back. Right? Understand the Brandon Dassey confession is a taped confession. Right? There's no evidence that the police, before they talked to Brandon Dassey, came up with a story that they wanted to feed to Brandon Dassey, to have Brandon Dassey tell them. Right? So the police framed him story just has too many holes to mention. Understand, Teresa Hallback was killed. Her teeth are in the burn pit, right? If you're gonna make the argument that the police brought her teeth to the burn pit, then you have to ask yourself, okay, if she's dead, who killed her? As I said in an earlier video, Unless you believe that the police happened to see her body on the side of the road and then decided, you know what, let's desecrate this body in such a way that we can frame Stephen Avery. So let's, you know, burn her body in his burn pit or let's burn her body some other place and bring the bones to the burn pit. And of course, keep in mind, even that, thought would be ridiculous, given that Stephen Avery lives next to family and easily could have been having dinner with them or out in some public scene at the time the police claimed he was burning her body in the burn pit. Right? So I do hope you listen to the Nancy Grace podcast by clicking on the link in the comment section of this video. Let me point out, too, that I have no association with Nancy Grace, right? She's just a commentator who I find to be completely right on this case, right? Netflix, longtime subscriber. I love the service. The people behind the Stephen Avery show, to me, are just flat out wrong. The idea that the police are planting Avery's blood is just downright wrong. Understand too, a police conspiracy would require the police to have Hallback's car and to be planting the car on Avery's property. Could you imagine what would have happened if a cop was found planting the car on Avery's property? Could you imagine how much bigger Avery's lawsuit would be could you imagine how many careers would be ended if the police were involved in such a sham? Didn't happen. I believe Avery is guilty. You know where I stand. Let me know where you stand in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.